Good evening and welcome to the Non-League Banter Show with me, Mick Sullivan, and my good friend, Gary Pascoe. Good evening, Gary. Good evening, Mick. How are you? I'm all right, mate. Looking forward to tonight's show? Yeah, I am looking forward to it. Like I said earlier in the week when we did a little preview, I haven't had much contact with Chairman, and it'd be nice to, when we talk to these guys tonight to find out how they they think about football, how they think about running a club. Like I say, it'd be really interested to get their thoughts on uh, football, non-league football. Well, I'll leave it to you, Gary. I'm going to let you introduce these multi-millionaires we've got sitting in front of us here. Away you go, son. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, why well, we introduce the chairman? Right, we've got the Aldershot Town Chairman, Shaheed Azim, Hungerford Town Chairman, Patrick, Patrick Chambers, Craig Wanderers Chairman, Gary Hillman, and finally, uh, Jersey Ball Chairman, Russell the Fever. Good evening, gentlemen, and thank you very much for giving up your Friday night to come on our show. Good evening, good evening. You're well? Good. Well, yeah, you are well, you look good. Yeah, good. So, uh, well, what I'm going to do is just give a little information to the listeners about you guys, just at one at a time, and because, uh, like I said, as someone said before we started the show, supporters don't really appreciate, not all supporters, but some supporters don't really appreciate chairman, what they put into the club, their time with, their, with the other committee people as well. So i just give you guys a little bit of a background so when they know who, what you're all about. So we'll start with you, Shahid. So obviously you're the Aldershot uh, Town Chairman. You've been chairman there since 2013 when you came in and helped buy the club out of uh, administration when they were reported to be in £1.4 million pound in debt, which, you know, and then, but within a year, all the town had turned it around and paid in full all their debts, so were making a, a moderate profit, and uh, you've been, in, well, you've been in charge of five managers while you've been there? Is yeah. that right? Well, yeah, I can't count the number of managers, obviously, yeah, probably about five, uh, but I think, uh, you know, it's um, uh, the club, it, 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 uh, everybody knows it's in Hampshire, it's a, it's a football league club, uh, went into administration in 2000 and uh, 2000, late 2012, the 13 end of season, sadly the guy that chairman owned it, it's such a situation, sadly he's passed away now, but the club went into administration and uh, I, I have to say that out of everything I've done in my life, that probably running the football club is probably the toughest job I've ever had. Uh, it, is. it is because you know all, all you're selling is is emotion on a on a Tuesday or a Saturday, and depending on you know if, the, if you get good results, you know sort of the wrong games coming up, you you know all the fans coming back, you can add another two or three hundred people to it, which makes a huge difference. Uh, have a bad result, you could lose you know over the season three four hundred thousand pounds. So it's, it's it's it is a difficult thing because you're not selling widgets or any kind of services. Selling emotion, so yeah, it's tough, but wouldn't, be, wouldn't do anything different, though. Sure. So, I would listen to Danny Sewell, the manager, uh, during the week, earlier in the week, and he was saying about it was a difficult start. He had a new manager. Obviously, did you feel it was a poor season? Like, like I know the season never finished, but do you feel it was a bit of a poor season? And what do you put that down to? And uh, obviously, this season, you're going to really try and push to get your team, well, promote it if they can. First of all, everybody who's sitting around this table, everyone wants to get promoted. You know, only one team can, you know, one or two teams can go from that year up into the playoffs. So everybody, you, know, you get involved in football because you want to win. Uh, and that's based how you win and how, how you conduct yourself. That's, that's, that's vital. That's just as important as winning for me, in my personal opinion. Um, you know, we, we, had, we had a tough season last year. Um, you know, it, it's a new team. And, and the problem comes with all football and, and you know, and, and it just between every manager. Unless you've got the, you know, sort of a, a decent financial sort of package behind the scenes um, and offering long-term con- contract and building a, a, a stable team in so, so you can keep core of the team uh, going forward and build on that, that's, that's, that's a challenge. And every, every year we seem to be rebuilding and we have done that at Aldershot. At now, the problem we've got is, is when you've got no money coming in the summer months and you still have to pay these two-year contracts, um, that causes huge financial problems when you've got outgoing and no, no income coming in. And, you know, and I, I, I joke about this, but the town is a tough town. And even the 
the town shop closed it down. That's how tough the town is. So uh, we're we, 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 we trying to, we try to, you know, but having said that, we've got fantastic, fantastic bunch of supporters. Fantastic. Every sponsor we had since I've been involved in it, all the major sponsors are still with us. And even through this, uh, you know, for the situation we're in currently, you know, the, the so just as many seasons as you get now, we're not even sure when seasons dying and, and all the vibes and every other support I've told them to move them through, they're still very much want to, you know, want to go, go forward. And I think that's why I think football clubs are, are a hub for communities. And I, I keep saying this, and it's a, it's a stack record, you know, football clubs make or break people week depending on the result. And I think that's that's what it, it means to all the people here, really. So it, it's a challenging, challenging time. But I think it's going to be a, when we come out this thing, this, it's going to be a huge reset for everybody. I think there's going to be a bundle of more players available. I know the you know, I'm aware that the, F- the EFL have released that sort of 15 other teams or, you know, you can only have 11 players. So I think it's going to be, maybe it's a, the, you know, the clubs and the manager's choice now, really. So, you know, the number of players that might be available. But, uh, yeah, we want, to, we want to win. But it's going to be a different season next season. Gary, can I just come in there? So, hey, can't you just sell one of your Bentleys to add to the money situation down there? <laughs> Now I've got a BMW, so I have to buy cars every sponsor who gets involved in the football club. So oh. every time you send a sponsor, I buy a car. <laughs> I'm sure the Aldershot town know differently. I'm sure they know the mansion you live in down that neck of the woods. Anyway, carry on, Gary. Fair enough. Right, thanks for that. We've turned through a packed chambers, the Hunger for Town chairman. Well, you become chairman around the end of April, May, and then you've been at the helm now for just over a year. Uh, Patrick, you're 60 years old, don't mind me saying. Okay, uh, nearly, nearly 60, I beg your pardon. Pension uh, age. Also a very keen Notts Forest fan and a massive Brian Clough fan. So uh, you saw your first game at Hungerford on April the 6th, 2019, just before you become chairman. And uh, Patrick and your and your vice chairman, Cole Reader, said you're both committed to do a maximum a maximum time of between three to five, a minimum sign of between three to five years in your role. So, uh, is this all new to you, being the chairman? Well, it certainly is. Well, yeah, Carl's no longer with the club. Um, he, think, had to, yeah, he had to take uh, a, a, another opportunity business wise, uh, sort of back in Christmas time. And yeah, when we were talking off air earlier, you know, I've been a businessman since I was 18 years old, uh, you know, I've had some incredible successes. I've had, a, I've had a couple of failures, which most people in business have had. But I don't think anything prepares you in the business world for being a chairman of a football club. Uh, all of a sudden, you've got emotion, you've got fans, you've got players, you've got coaches, you've got the manager, you've got the committee, you've got your sponsors. And obviously, I'm a football fan. You know, Of course, you want to see your team win. Uh, every, anybody that knows anything about Hunger for Town knows that you know, we're a we're a very small club that are you know punching above our weight. Um, we're about to go into our fifth season at this level, which okay, a lot of people might think we're very lucky because of the you know, the situation. But I, I think that now needs to be something that we should be very proud of. But trying to find the balance between trying to stay at this level. And God bless them, the committee over the last three years have tried to compete financially as best they can. But you only have to look in the non league paper about the potential wage cap they're talking about for step two of 450,000 to half a million. Welcome. <laughs> Crikey, that would like triple you know, any, any budget that we've had previously. But I think I learned a lot in that, that first year. And I think I'm going into next season. I think I'll I'll, I'll be a better chairman for it. Uh, obviously, I, I had that year with Ian Herring. It was on your show a, a, a couple of weeks ago, and I probably wasn't in a position where I could advise him or help him. Um, you know, he was the guy that knew about football. I'm the fan, and I'm there to just find this sustainable model. But. As things developed and we, we hit financial problems in February, which we went public about, you know, we, we couldn't pay our players, which was very embarrassing. Uh, you know, the weather contributed. You know, we went two, three weeks without a home game. 
and we were literally squeezing every penny from our budget into playing stuff. And clearly that, that couldn't continue. And one thing that I did say to the, the committee, the members when I was voted in, was I would find them a sustainable model. Because, you know, you, you have the badge as a chairman, but ultimately I, I, I think the other guys would agree, you're the caretaker. You know, you don't, I don't own this club. You know, I'm the caretaker of it. And it's been going since, you know, the late 19th century. And my job's to make sure it's still there. I want to fight and stay in the National League South. I think in Danny Robinson, I've got the manager that will do that. I'm actually very, very confident going into next season, even though we've publicly slashed our budget, which allegedly was the smallest in the division anyway. But we managed to retain a few key players from last season who have who have took a wage cut, you know, who could have stepped down and got more money, but fair play to them. You know, they want to stay and play at the highest level they, they can. We've got a few youngsters that have been superstars at step, step three, step four, who want to challenge themselves. That to us, we have come for expenses. Um, you've got a, a couple of players that have been released who've been full time, who feel aggrieved. They want to be in the shop window. So we've got to work smart and. You know, let's be fair, National League South is a great shop window. You know, for the last two seasons, well, Shahid's got one of our players from two seasons ago, Ralphie Whittingham. Uh, we had Marv, our captain, that signed a pro contact with Newport, and a youngster that joined us last season who'd been released from Brighton. He's on the verge of signing a pro contract. So, you know, in two seasons, that's three players that have turned pro. So we've got to, we've got to make sure we use all the positive things about competing at this level, but we've got to start believing there's a little town that, hey, you know, going into five, fifth season, you know, a couple of managers, mm -hmm. lots of players have earned the right to play at this level. We've now got to be proud of it. We've now got to say, look, you know, we have only got a population of 6,000. We are the smallest area in the National League South, but I think we're going to surprise a few people next season. I really do. You mentioned Ian Perry, and uh, he was on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he did say that he, he wanted the club to support him, and uh, but they, they they couldn't do it. What, what did he want support for? Why couldn't they support him? Um, it's, it's a difficult one that because obviously when I when I came in, there was a budget agreed, and a lot of that, that budget was basically based on previous information that I was given. Uh, my wife and I worked really hard. We brought in over sixty thousand pounds with donations and sponsorship, and we honestly believe we've done enough to support the budget. All Ian wanted was want to know what the budget is. I won't breach it, and he wanted to just deal with everything. So I never got involved with contracts, whether a player was on a contract, whether they were non-contract. Again, I realised now that was probably a mistake. And you know, Ian, a man of integrity. I really like him. We haven't had a fallout at all. Um, you know, he stepped down, and I understand why he stepped down. But I think sometimes when you become a player manager like Ian did, and then you start managing that that line between being a player and then becoming a manager, I think he gets a bit blurred sometimes. And I think Ian always had the best interests of the players at heart, which I, I fully understand and I support. But from the club's point of view, we did have too many players on a contract. And I think if Ian was totally honest, there was perhaps a couple of players that he signed on a contract that maybe didn't work out. And then you haven't got that flexibility to move them on and bring somebody else in. So our budget was spent. Then we hit the tough times where I had to say to him, we need to cut it because we can't, we can't pay the players. And you know, he took it on the chin. He, he did get annoyed, and there were some heated conversations at that time. But I think my inexperience didn't help at that point. I think what I've learned, I think now, you know, I've set a wage cap. I speak to every single player that is considering playing for the town, and we use we're working smart. So I like to think as a businessman, I'm a good negotiator. A lot of managers who've been players, they're not businessmen. You know, they're, they're still players at heart. They're, 
they, they want to learn those skills and they've done their badges and they can coach a player, but the business side of a club is incredibly important. So I think now I've got the right balance and I think in Dami, you know, we've we've already developed a really good relationship. This is a player who really fancies, he knows what our wage cap is. We talked to that player and you know, we've been quite pleasantly surprised that we persuaded a few players to play for us. Well, I'll stop you there, we're going to talk about Danny later. Yeah, yeah. So I think we, that we're, just, we're, just, we're, we're, we're talking about the manager later, your new manager. So, uh, yeah, do not mind me just stopping you there and uh, we can have a chat about him later. Over to you, Mick. Right, I, I'm going to introduce Mr. Gary Hillman, the chairman of Cray Wanderers, the new up and coming team with a new ground on the horizon. Um, let's give you a bit, bit of Gary's background. Apparently, Gary, you went there to take over for a few weeks and ended up doing a 30 year stint. Is that about right? Uh, 26 and counting as it goes, yeah. So, yeah. Well, uh, 20, 25 in November last year, so yeah. Well, I'll take me out of, if you've got to work with Russell and Joe Vines down there, you must be resilient at the very least, mate. So, but, <laughs> but listen, tell us about Flamingo Park. Let's tell us about this exciting ground that's going to be up and running when. Um, yeah, well, Flamingo, well, basically ever, ever since I've become chairman, uh, we've um, never owned our own ground. I've always been trying to get our own ground. So the last 13 years now, we've been in planning, uh, managed to get planning. Wow, and I've seen the plans. It looks like a, what step would it? Is it up to step one level, as such, or would it be just a step three yeah, level yeah, ground? Yeah, unofficially, it's up to step one level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, it's it's on a seven eight acre site, so there's plenty of room around it. Um, yeah, it's, it's easy to get up to step one uh, uh, without too much trouble at all. Plans. It looks like. Who's that? Someone stepped in there? Nothing. <laughs> well, Nothing. anyway, moving on from that one, Gary, are you a bit of a minor celebrity? I've, I've, I've been digging about a little bit here. Did you appear on Salvage Hunters? Were you one of the guys in the sort of, one of these guys in the sort of, um, how can I put it, yard selling stuff? Or were you people, were you one? Dragon's Yeah, and Dragon's Den. Or were you one of the dragons? Come on, tell us all about this. <laughs> Gary, yeah, per perhaps, yeah, per yeah. wow, perhaps we should do a Dragon's Den with these guys and, <laughs> and, and we get non-league clubs come and see these guys. That would be good, wouldn't it? They've all got the money to be able to fund some of them. So perhaps we'd do a non-league banter Dragon's Den and we'll invite these four chairmen back on and see if they will part with any of their money. You fancy that? Any of you up for that one? Anyway, right, thanks, Gary. We'll move on to um, Russell the Fever, and he's the Jersey Bulls chairman. I hope I've pronounced your name right. Have I pronounced it right, Russell? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Yeah, the Fever. Fantastic, mate. And let's talk about you a little bit. You, um, I think, you're co-founder of the club in 2018. You're a former player. 
So you're a little bit different from these other guys. So, so you know, you're not in the multi-millionaire status, or are you out there for for a tax haven, or what? What What's the story? <laughs> some of the rivalry with Guernsey because I've been out in Guernsey I've managed out there there must you know have you learned a lot of the lessons from them going up the pyramid before you let's say so they stole the march on Jersey a little bit are you I know you're right rivals but are you sort of friends as well do you talk to their chairman to learn what can help Jersey Bulls The, the pitfalls and we might touch on them later in the show Russell but I want to ask you um, about the promotion you know that's a, I don't know if our other chairman here 
we are talking about step six and so step five and six are a bit close to my heart as well because that's where I come from and to have won your league already and then be told that the league's going to be null and void because that's the situation of this what this virus has done um, must be gut-wrenching for you yourself the volunteers the players and it must be so difficult for you at the minute. I'm rather hoping, I'm really rather hoping that someone or something will happen, that you will get that deserved promotion to combine counties, whether it's by default because of the situation. And I'm wondering whether you're hanging on the hope that that could be the, the way. Yeah, I mean, we would still love to love to be moved up to step five. Um, like you say, we, we hadn't, we haven't won the league, if you like, but we had one promotion. We were guaranteed. Promotion. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, you're right. So, I mean, when that did happen, um, at the time, obviously, we had this pandemic, and we had to put everything in perspective. And I think, to be fair to the club and the committee and the players, they pretty much everyone took it on the chin and went, well, you know, like, as we all know, there's greater things going on right now. Um, uh, and, but yeah, obviously we are we are disappointed. We we would love still to be moved up to step five. I think the players uh, have demonstrated this season. I don't think there could be any arguments from from the clubs in our league. Um, they've often said it to us that yeah, we've had to as a new club come in uh, and effectively you're meant to start at step seven, but we were given dispensation to start at step six. We saw how Guernsey progressed rapidly through the league. I mean, their record in their first season, step six, was pretty similar to what we've done. So we knew or we hoped it would be a similar situation. I mean, we didn't expect to, to not even draw or lose a game uh, throughout the entire season and to actually have won every competitive game the club has played and to have won promotion and then been told mm, actually that you, it doesn't count. You got the prize, but we're going to... Well, gonna take Ru Russell... <laughs> I feel for you, mate, and I feel for all the Jersey fans and everyone. But, you know, I will ask Jack. We've got Jack, who's the vice president of the, the FA, coming on later in the show. We might be able to throw a swerve ball at him and say, what is he going to do for Jersey ball? So, you know, stay there. You can ask a question to Jack when he comes on. He's a lovely guy, and he will answer most questions. So we're going to move on a little bit and open the debate out to all the chairmen now. So this is, this is a question to all of you, and sort of just take it in turn, because it's a really interesting question that most fans might want to find out, is, um, I bet, you know, to start, why would you want to be a chairman of a football club? You know, because it's not like a, a glamour job, is it, at this level? Why do you want to be a chairman of a non-league football club? There you go. Bounce it around you. Who's coming up first? Whoa. Go on, go on, Patrick, you go first. Oh, yeah, Seems I'm probably one of the youngest. <laughs> um, I've, I've always been a football fan um, all, all my life. Obviously, I live in Berkshire now, so watching Nottingham Forest wasn't really practical. <laughs> so this is a true story. But I, I had a business partner back in the nineties, and we did used to do a bit of sponsorship with Alfreton Town. We had a factory in Alfreton, and every now and again, there'd be somebody who got a job. In the factory, it was on fifty pound a week more, and I'd say to my production director, I'd say, "What's going on here?" And he'd say, "Just send it forward, man." And we had like half of the Alfreton Town football team playing, uh, working in our factory. So anyway, to move on, so I'm living down here, and I'm saying to my wife, "Look, I, I need a hobby." I, <laughs> I couldn't really go and watch Reading because obviously I've cheered Forest on against them. Same with Southampton, and I said, "I think I'm going to go and watch Hunger for Town." And I kept saying, I'm going to go and watch, I'm going to watch. And anyway, one day, my wife saw something on Facebook saying that the chairman was stepping down, the treasurer, the secretary, the manager's leaving, they're in financial difficulties. My wife said, you make up the chairman. And literally, eight days later, it was like being in a beauty contest without any contestants. And all of a sudden, I, 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 was, I had not even seen them play. I've never even been to a non-league match in my life. But I probably went in with a bit of a wrong heart. She said, yeah, yeah, but this will be all right. Um, but actually now, any regrets? No. Um, I, love, I put roots down in this community. I love it here in the Lambour Valley, in the area of Hong It's a beautiful part of the world. And I think it's about putting a bit back, but also enjoying your football. I love match days. I love the fact that set two is sort of the highest level you can play with a pint and a pie in your hand. 
at Pete's side. I really, really like that. I don't know. So, so he might say you could do that down all the shot town. But anyway, carry on. I, I thought you don't allow an alcohol by the pitch at step one. Oh, fair point. Well done, Patrick. You've done your homework, yeah, mate. No, well done. Step two is the highest level of football in the United Kingdom that you can be with a pint of pints. Right. So now, yeah. you know, I've got the book. Now I'm a Hungerford fan. Obviously, I, I try to help them, you know, financially as, as, as much as I can. But more importantly, try to put down know the right foundation so that you know when I have done my three to five years they'll be hopefully not in a better division than, than I found them but in a better situation in the way the club is run the finances so yeah I, I, I absolutely love it and it, it, I'm just a fan really and a fan who's putting a bit back into their community thank you Shahi same as me really and then someone asked uh, Philip, well, not obliged, it's the wrong word, but it's, it's part of your community and trying to sort of do the best thing for the area and the, and the football club. What do you get out of it, Gary? What do you get out of it, Gary? You must get something out of it, surely. Headaches. I've been getting headaches. <laughs> <laughs> we know you do, Shahid. <laughs> I've actually sort of, as I've been chairman so long, I've sort of uh, wingled me way out, so I don't really do much. So, uh, yeah, so I think at the early stages, it's, it's very easy to get involved with the sort of nitty gritty, shall we say, of the players, etc. about the you know, sort of things on the ones we have on our team, say, and uh, literally turn up the first game of the season and say, who's that, who's that, who's that. So, uh, and, like, you choose the manager. We've always had managers that, and at the moment, say, like Russell Joe Bright is a great one. In their blood, in drinking before that, 22 years. So we've always sort of promoted, competing of people that have always been great people. Which, um, the higher the level you, you go up, I always believe you need to sort of get people that die at the club, and then you need to lift a bit of a superstar player as well. So whatever you need, if you can't have 11 superstars, if you can't have 11 people that die at the club, you need to get that right blend. So to me, you get the right blend to the right manager. Well, I think I think your club in particular, I've got to say, Gary, are very together. I know Russell and Joe and yourself are pretty much a good little dream team in amongst three of you. You play some fantastic football in that 3G down at Bromley. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of togetherness from the times that I've visited that club, more than what I have down all the shop. And uh, the others I haven't visited so much, but I, you know, I can tell the viewers it's a together club and, it, and it's on the up. And uh, I really hope, I hope in the next year or two. And again, you you got affected by what happened. The Jersey Bulls this year, you got affected. You were in the playoffs, didn't you? You know, so yeah, we were second in the league, and we was absolutely we had a lot of injuries and stuff. And historically, we just kept going at the end. So we were really fortunate to just be worthy. It was top of the league. Been to one down at their place, they had a hard run in the place, and we had sort of an easier run. So, we really, really thought we'd well, at least get in the playoffs, and hopefully, you know, everyone was saying we was going to win the league. So, uh, yeah, so we was obviously disappointed coming second and then not doing the points per game. Was, well, I think they made it personally, I think the, the decision was made. I agree with the decision to stop the league, and obviously, with the players, monies and contracts, etc, etc, like that. So I agree with that bit, but I think it was a bit hasty just to do another voyage straight away. Uh, I did say about before the, like, the National League sort of made the decision, and especially with the Berry game out of business as well, there was always going to be, have to be some sort of promotion from the National League. So, um, yeah, you yeah, know, we, we, you know, we, that world, we'll, we'll have a word with Nick Robinson on your behalf, Gary. Don't worry, mate. <laughs> yeah, well, well uh, it's, uh, the way I see it, like, we, we actually won. We actually won the league in 2002, 2003, or points per game. So we had Fabish was in our league. Everyone we beat Sydney away. We did play them twice, and then they went out of business. So we was just expecting all the right results to be uh, taken away. Maidstone and Thamesby got into the committee and all of a sudden, before the last game of the season, they said, oh, well, I'm going to do points per game, meaning that all our players had to do with their last game and they would have won the league. Uh, fortunately, they drew their, 
through that game. We won our last two and we actually won the league on points per game. Uh, and we've never been top all season. But it, I, I felt the committee, the committee system, like the decision for the in the committee was if it was six teams, I'd say like it should be to level. If the committee was made up of six people, all in the top uh, top six teams, if they would have made points per game. But because the committee was, you know, you know, if I was on the committee, you know, I was a player of that season, I was in the relegation zone, I would have voted another point. So, you know, to not have the, the teams to vote, like the National League, like all the other leagues, to my, to my point, my, that was, you know, that was, to ever, if all the teams voted and they voted another voice, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Just for the committee to, to vote, which obviously, beat down, they would add some sort of self-interest, um, but, you know, to me that was wrong. Fair enough. Right, I'll ask you two that Russell and Dash are you another question now. Right, what, what are your thoughts for the coming season? Like, have you started planning with your managers? Have you organised friendlies, like spoken to other clubs? Have you decided on your budget? Have you set yourself personal goals for the club? And that other challenges? I'll start with you, Russell, and then I'll go over to, to Shaheed with that one. Um, well, quite a few questions there. So, um, yeah, our managers... Um, Gary Freeman, he's done a fantastic job last year. He's he's currently going around all the playing squad at the moment um, and getting their eye in for next season. Uh, obviously, being on an island, the, the players can't actually move to another club uh, in the National League system, which um, means they're going to be available for us again, which other clubs on the, in the UK know they've lost some of them. When they've been denied promotion, they've lost their managers, they've lost, lost players to other clubs higher up. Um, so, yeah, they get together with their squad at the moment, obviously with the restrictions, uh, COVID-19, and we have to be mindful of how we do things. I think on the island, we're, we're lucky in that at the moment, there's, there's very few cases. Um, so we're looking to try and start some kind of training shortly, but at this, at this point in time, we don't even know when next season is going to start. Um, what about friendlies? Because obviously you're on the island, but it's difficult to get in friendlies and competitive friendlies as well. Yeah, we had some friendlies lined up against clubs from uh, um, the National League, uh, National League South. We had clubs lined up coming over this season for pre-season, but um, with again with COVID nineteen, with travel, we're in a situation whereby um, the borders are closed on Jersey at the moment. We're not accepting people into the island. Um, if people are coming, it's sort of almost essential travel, and they have to quarantine for. 14 days when they come. We're allowed to leave the island and go to the UK, um, but it's going to be difficult for our players. They can't get back and go to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, there's so many unknowns. We're, we're just monitoring it day by day. Um, but we do want to get the players together um, as much as just to try and get that momentum or keep that bit of momentum as well. We were obviously flying last season. The players were incredible. I mean, the efforts they went to last season just just a bit of background like if we play a midweek game the players take a half day off work they leave the tip day they travel to the UK they play the evening game they can't fly back that night because the airport shuts um, at Sam's obviously not an international airport they stay overnight in Gatwick they wake up at sort of half five uh, get on the flight take their work in with them they go straight to work on the Wednesday so I mean the commitment of the players has been absolutely superb. When we, we, we explained this is what it's going to be like, having known what happened in Guernsey, we said that, that this is what it's going to be like, well, you better know what you're signing up to. And to a credit to a man, they've been absolutely brilliant this season. And the management team, you know, they do exactly the same job as well. So, sure. yeah, at the moment, we're, there's a lot of unknowns, but hopefully Gary can get the playing squad together soon. OK, Shane, what about yours? Your boys back training? Well, I think uh, all, all our players have been... Uh living up with Danny. Danny is uh, our manager, is obviously very much a, a social media technology led guy, so he's been doing a lot of trainings uh, by Zooms and uh, having sort of classes sort of a couple of hours or an hour and a half a day. And then actually other clubs have also joined in, other, other, other sort of players joined in as well. So that's a beauty for it virtually on your own. Um, as Russell said, it's, you know, it's uh, acting and prepare for a season when you don't even know when you're going to start. And, and for us, uh, the, the best thing we're doing at the moment is we, have, we as, a, as a club, are locked down. Uh, we 
interesting. We found out a lot of areas where we could save quite a bit of money. We ended up, we found out we had three meters. Uh, one for uh, when the floodlights comes on. We had a when we had the pitch uh, installed. We had a, a heater there that kept the water warm, so it didn't freeze. So that there's money going in there even through the summer. So it's been a it's been a great experience where we've been able to shut down and and, and uh, revisit every area of the the operational side so there's, there's an opportunity to save money there but like everybody else we you know our, our view is and you know the, the Danny is that we can't be offering any contract with anybody uh, until probably a month before that we know when the first issue is because you, you can't have outgoings going out at our level of football without any income coming in and, and uh, as Russell said if you don't know when the season starts we have a good guess when it's going to start now you're going to be what sort of crowd you're going to have, you're going to have hospitalities, you know, bars, all of those areas. If you commercially, if you've got no income coming in, then um, you've got, you know, and the budget is whatever the budget is. Um, and, and we're looking at our budget at the moment is the way the world is, we predicting that or uh, we're budgeting that we're going to reduce the crowd uh, from last year, maybe, you know, 15, 1600. Uh, and if they have these social distancing, you know, if they go for 25% of our capacity, that gives us probably 1,800, 1,900. But that means we have to open, uh, as Patrick said, our, our, our ground is designated ground. So, and it's a very old ground, which means that we have to, for health and safety, we've got to virtually have 54 students, we have to two safety officers, the safety officer, video guys, sound supervisors. Our cost of the student would be about five, six grand. And if you've got no money coming in from the other areas, you know, from the bars and the you know, for hospitality, it, it just doesn't work for us. Um, so that's got to be a, it's all unknown at the moment, and I think it's, it's going to reset for everybody. Do you think, would you like, would you like to have a, uh, not a death, well, a definite day, but a day that we that everybody's working soon? Would, would, that, would, be, would that be a help to you, Chairman, or not? Jay? Yeah, so, so, the problem is, you see, you know, so, um, not, uh, yeah, it'd be great to know when we're going to start, but they've got to be sort of a guarantee when we've got to start, because it's got to be guaranteed. And the most important thing is, from a, um, and, I, and, and I'll, I'd, I'd love to hear Patrick in about four years' time, when you come with a business brain into a football club, before you know it, you, you leave that business brain, you get too emotionally involved in it, and you start making drastic, you know, sort of emotional decisions, is it so that you, so, for, for me, it would be along the lines of actually looking at uh, the most, we've got to get guarantee when the income is going to come in. That's, that's the most important thing. Unless we know when the income's coming in, there's no way there's any outgoing income. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. That's fair enough. Yeah. So, uh, anyone else got any other points they want to make about like planning and budgets? Well, hold on, Gary. Can I, sorry, can I just step in there? I'm just putting I'm putting this out to because I'm I'm just I'm acting as a fan for a Craig Wanderers fan, an Aldershot fan, a Jer Jersey Bulls fan, a Hungerford Town fan. What you as chairman? What? How are you going to get your teams promoted this year? Because surely that is the the end plan for, for you this season to try and get your team promoted. Otherwise, I, I can't believe many managers would be working at the club if that weren't your goal to actually get them this season and whether you've given your manager the tools to do it. Thank you. 
Patrick, Frank. Patrick, can I step in there? Because I'm a fan of Under yeah. the Town, and I'm saying, yeah. hold up, I want to hear my chairman say that we've got a three-year plan, a five-year plan that we want to be promoted, not really want to be staying in the league and be competitive. So I'm a fan. That's what. That's uh, you know, might well be a few that might think that way, but as a general football fan. You know, the press is on you lot here that we got in, we're interviewing tonight. The press is on you to come up with that plan to get your team promoted or the best days to get them promoted. And, well, you know, sorry to put that on you, but that's how no, I feel. No, 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 I'm, I'm cool. I, so, with all due respect, I'd like to think I have a personal relationship with the vast majority of our fans who are realistic who realise that to play at step two at Hungerford Town is an incredible achievement. And, you know, I think sometimes you've got to take a bit of a reality check. You know, Hungerford Town in the National League South, you know, even in West Berkshire, you know, we are the premier team in West Berkshire. You've got Newbury that, you know, sadly, you know, the Dubai, you know, had a demise. You've got Thatcher, way bigger population than us playing at step four and um, feel sorry for them. So I, I think we're actually quite realistic as a bunch of fans. I think we know we are striving to stay where we are. That is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for Hungerford Town to be proud and loud and stay a step two club. But wouldn't, that, it, wouldn't it be better to go one step backwards then, Patrick, to take two steps forward and be no, successful and get the confidence, you know what I mean, rather than keep on struggling in that relegation zone with that step two. No, I think mean, next year, someone like Hungerford Town, it's actually, he doesn't realise it at the moment, but it's actually going to be in a much, much stronger position than they are this year. No, we are. There's a table come out, like right, so head seat with the, with the 25%. So sort of everyone's getting the gut feeling it's going to be a 25% capacity. So someone like, you know, your big teams up at, well, Davies, Dulwich, Starford, their capacity is going to go, their, their income is going to drop substantially. So your, your, your player's wage is always going to be the same. And then, like I say, then if Reading, for example, their capacity goes 25%, people are going to go and follow the local teams. So someone like Hungerford, I can see their, their, um, their crowds going triple tickets of, of Reading and all that. And then, and then you'll be, then because your crowds will be tripling up, you'll be able to, you know, your player's budget go up and then your, your player's budget because of the crowd going down for the sort of big teams up the top in the crowds, you're going to be nearer to them than, than you've ever been before. So I can see teams like, I can see with the capacities that the, the, the leagues are going to get much closer now. The, yeah. the ones with the smaller crowds are actually going to ben benefit like us at Bromley. Uh, we get 300, 250, 300 and if they bring in this 25% we're, we're you know, from his fault, as capacity in Palace Mill, like obviously the big teams around us, Palace Mill, Cholton, even Dunwich, they all go down to 25%. And if that's that the case, you know, we're hoping we, our crowds could go, you know, could go up. And then the, the teams we're competing against, teams like Worthing, for example, Worthing averaging a thousand each, a uh, thousand a game, free GP seven days a week, you know, the bar open seven days a week. They're, they're their income's going to go down substantially, where our income's going to go up, so it's going to be sort of levelling it out. So, I, I, personally, I feel if the capacity does come in next year, the leagues are going to be much tighter, you know, from the top to the bottom. Yeah. I, I'm just finishing off on what Gary said there. So, you know, I, I think it's spot on, Gary. I, I think there's going to be a huge levelling. Um, what we've got to think, so, you know, we're in West Berkshire, so Newbury's got 40,000 people. Patrick's got 26,000 people, we've got 6,000. But at this minute in time, we are the premier team in West Berkshire, which means the best players within 20 miles of Hungerford Town want to play for us. They don't want to play for Thatcham in step four. They don't want to play for Newbury. They want to play for Hungerford Town. So it's important that we stay as a step two club, as a minimum. It is, if promotion came along, we'd all go, wow, but we've got to be realistic. We, we, we haven't really got a budget to compete at this level. We have to be smart. But I do think, Gary, we have talked about that, Gary. And, you know, if that 25% crowd capacity comes in, 
you know, we normally get you know three to four hundred. Yeah, you know, we could have seven hundred and fifty every match, which that would be a game changer for us. So I do think there will be a compression of the leagues, and I think there'll be a lot of chairmen that normally pump in a lot of money to a lot of clubs that might be in a business that, that can't do it next season. So there'll be a lot of sponsors that can't put the money in. You know, we've already spoken to a few of our sponsors, and it's like, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. You know, we've already budgeted to take that into account because of the situation we're in. So, yeah, I think we could find ourselves being more competitive. Anyone else got a point to make? Well, I think from 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 all of your point of view, bear in mind the extent that we've sure. been. In a John, have you um, come in yet? I've not seen you come in. And, and, and the, the invite. For the, the supporters who watch, you know, the sort of Man United play there, they beat West Ham there. So if the team might not, they would have lost all of them. But what I've guaranteed them, oh, you know, oh, what I've oh. promised is two things. One is, um, uh, like Gary was saying, we, we've been just going through a, a, a lease with the council. You've got to build a relationship with the council, the council on ground, and, you know, they've granted us a pretty decent lease. And so we're talking, and it, and it's all short sure football covers it. So I want to make sure we deliver the development, which is uh, sort of house associate hotel, and we, we develop the ground. I mean, I'll give you an example. Two years ago, we had a gas leak. We didn't know what it was. It cost fifty-two thousand pounds to run a pipe from the high street to there. Now that cost the football club. Now that doesn't bring anything to the line apart from hot water for the players and something to cook on. But that's the ground is part by sell by day. So we've got to get that right, and that's what I'm guaranteeing. And the second thing is. Um, you know, we spent money, we, we played with the hope and ambition, but it's getting the foundation right, get the structure right, get the commercial income coming in, use the facilities six, seven days a week, and that's that's the legacy. I, can, I can't promise anybody promotion because that's, that's you know, the people out there, you know, sort of committing they're going to be promoted in the football league in, in a year time, two years time. It, uh, it's, you know, just look at Barrett, they've been there 48 years in the in the National League and they've finally got promotion. You know, 48 years later, I mean, we've got Wrexham that's been in their massive club um, in that, you know, it's very much the, the matches they play, Wrexham. So it's, it's, National League is probably the, is one of the most difficult leagues to come out of. So the rules are higher coming out of National League into League 2 um, and everybody wants to want to get there. And, but uh, as Patrick said and as Gary said, I think it's, 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 it's this virus that we had I think it's a wake-up call for everybody. Okay, well, we'll see John Solarco. Good evening, John. How are you? How are you doing? Yeah, you drove me away from this first Man United game. I was going to tell you the score then. I don't yes. so. Sorry, no. mate. Um, I shouldn't really. I mean, it, it, you know, I have to say that, you know, the big end of the game is going to get so much profile. And, Without a doubt, and I'm going to quickly say this, that that end of the game should really look after you guys and the grassroots of football. And it's, it's quite shameful that they toe to toe. But, you know, let's uh, crack on with the <laughs> No worries. Well, we give you a, bit, a little bit about you. People must know you, John, no doubt. You know, ex-professional footballer. Started in 1986, Crystal Palace, made 215 appearances. And uh, you finished at Brentford in 2005, a career of 19 years as a professional footballer, 510 games, 49 goals. You got a runners-up medal, FA Cup medal when you drew three all with Man, uh, with Man United. Uh, that replay, that was a real. I was there at Wembley, funny enough, with Murray Jones, and you probably know Murray. Yes. So uh, I was there, and then uh, you got five England caps as well. That's your football. Isn't it? Is that correct? You had five caps. That's not bad, actually. That really is <laughs> Stats um, out. <laughs> you know what, let's, let's leave Man United. Man United have made it my career. Yeah, I can imagine. Because <laughs> when, we, when we played in that FA Cup final, that I was 21 against uh, Man United, that was really the turning point for Alex, for Alex Ferguson, I should say. Slightly thought, if he lost that game, he'd been sad. He won that game. Mark Hughes, I remember, you know, we were 3-2 up. Right, he came on with those couple of goals. And, uh, you know, Mark Hughes got that goal, 3-3. We lost 1-0 in the replay. And uh, Sir Alex Ferguson never look back and you know whenever I see Sir Alex he still remembers those days and he still remembers us and he, he's so brilliant uh, but we also lost in another semi-finals at Villa Park, Park yeah. obviously when I was uh, when I was coach um, first in coach with Palace uh, under Pardew Keith Miller the assistant we got to the final against Man United in, in the 16 
16, 15, 16 season, which we again lost to a, a Jesse Lingard um, goal. So, lost, 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 let's not mention Man United, please. Let's focus on Let's get on about what you do, John. You're, you've got John, 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 I'm, I'm a layman here. I'm I'm Jersey Balls chairman, Russell, sitting there listening to your patter. What can you do for me to get Jersey sort of back and up and running? He's at step six at the minute, probably going to hopefully get to step five. Clubs down at a level. You've, we, we all know the likes of Shahid and um, even come back Patrick. I've got a few bob in the coppers at that level. But these, yeah. these, poor, these poor boys down at step five and six, really need your help as well. So what what can you do to help them? Well, it, it's almost the same. It, it's a lot of what I do is, you know, you can refurbish clubhouses, you can improve your facilities there, get guys coming, drinking, eating, even on the, you know, sort of putting on, you know, dance nights, race nights, you know, getting people, once it all gets going again, you know, you, as I say, you've got the grants, the lottery, I sort of help fund and put together a lot of 3G pitch models. They're fantastic and it's probably the way to go. My local club here where I live in Epsom, Sutton, has got a fantastic model. They put the 3G pitch in, it's rented, they play five or six games every weekend. It's used, you know, sort of five, seven, ten hours a week, every day. You yeah. Know, they've got facilities where you've got conferencing, you can have networking meetings, Hiring out events, and then obviously you've got weddings and parties, and, and clubs are clubs are the, the the cornerstone of communities. Really, everyone loves their club. And you know, when I grew up at West Ham, we you know everything happened down. We used to play cricket during the summer, and football in the in the winter, and but everyone gravitated. If you wanted a beer, you went down to the clubhouse, you had a beer with your mates. John, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you help 
these non-league clubs get up and running or help them at least on the track back because of the COVID-19 result. Can you, can your company or your resources, whatever pack you send out to these clubs, you know, help them with initiatives, funding from the FA or whatever? Do you cover lots of little areas that you would help? Is it you personally or is it a team of people from your company that help these clubs? Yeah, this is very much a team of people at my club group that are putting together all these initiatives. We've got lots of ambassadors. Um, obviously, we've got Sam Allardyce, who's in the latest podcast. Um, Simon Millen, we've got Rob Shepard, who's our top you know, media guy. But behind the scenes, that is what we're trying to do, is hopefully we can advise and help clubs access grants, which they may not have known about, which you know they, they just weren't aware of, that they were entitled to. And even if it's 10, 15, 20 grand that they're accessing, then that could be a lifeline for them. And then obviously that's what we're saying. If you can get the lotto, get involved in the marketplace, and then we can talk about lots of other things, as in, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? So it's just putting together some ideas and a business plan. But look, there's no way we can guarantee um, in any shape or form. Because, I mean, where football is right now, it was in a different difficult place and these chairmen will all know and this is where I admire you guys so much they put blood, sweat and tears into running clubs and so much money into running it and it is a passion it's a labour of passion, it's more heart than head because otherwise no one would do it but they are cornerstones of communities and everyone and, and, and you want to give something back to the game and it's so important for the kids to, to play sport, it's so important for, everyone, for us all to exercise and get out and it so good for our mental welfare to be able to play football and, and, and it leads on to so many things. But we're all businessmen. It's a bit of networking. You know, you join a golf club. You join one join a golf club, you play golf. But actually, it's a bit of networking. You know, at least that's what you tell the wife. And, you know, you tell it's very important. You go out because it's important. But it is all important. And it is all part and parcel of what we do. And, and I think the more advice, the more help you can get, it just might trigger little bits that, that will give you a little... A light bulb moment of we can do that, we should do that, and then of course, you know, you've got to sit down with, with committees and make sure it's go through and, and make sure it works for the club. But you know, right from you know, cost saving as well, we look at cost saving what can you save on costs and what can you do more to generate revenue? So it's more of an interesting conversation that this COVID isn't going to go away, there's going to be a lot of clubs in trouble, and especially the ones that aren't run well. So, all the advice, I mean, hopefully. You know, we've got some, some good clubs and it is so tough running football clubs and sports clubs. So, you know, my admiration goes out to you guys, but we really are there to try and help the conversation and facilitate and maybe help you, um, you know, just, just give you that extra 10, 20 percent that might make the difference. Guys, right, have anyone got any questions you'd like to ask John about anything? No. I, 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 yeah, I think that, that, you know, so for us, that you're absolutely right. We've got a the high street presence there, um, you know, but again, you're quite right, we've got to get something from the council. We talk about digital screens, as you know, we've got a digital screen that we bought three or four years ago, which now pays for itself. It, it's, um, but I think what you just said is that I think all clubs should be looking at these under, under the cer certain circumstances we're going through. I think there's lots of grants available apart from the, um, you know, we talk about furlough and, 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 and sort of a retail and major grant. But I think from the foundation point of view, and if, if, if any one of you guys got a you know, the foundation side of the football club, there's a number of number of grants available. We've been very successful, very mind we're a military town and we managed to secure quite a number of grants uh, to the support the veterans, the homeless, um, and you know, created a vets hub. So our, 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 our foundation side is actually been very successful under under the challenging times. Russell, what about you? You're on an island. I know I keep, I know I keep saying it, but it's, it's quite an important factor. You are on an island. And how does, you know, things like John has said already, I presume you must do that race nights and things like that for you in your club. I've never been I've never been to Jersey Football Club, so I, I haven't. I would like to, you to explain to me, can we have weddings there? Can you have functions there? Yeah, well, we actually use, uh, we have our own government on the island, so in terms of, COVID-19, we're, we're sort of in different stages to the UK at the moment and we get different government guidance. So we're, we're sort of trying to follow our own government guidance and getting FA guidance on what we can do and when we can do it. So we're waiting on that. So we, 
Our stadium, Springfield Stadium, is a government-owned facility. When we set up the club, we went to the um, chief minister, who is sort of our prime minister, if you like. We went to him and then senior politicians and said, look, this is what we're aiming to do. We need the backing of the government, and they gave us their full support. Uh, in terms of revenue streams, we've we've got a fantastic commercial team to go out, and we, we we've got some fantastic sponsors that support the club. Uh, currently, we're sort of in a, we're in a stable position at the moment. Um, obviously, we've got no outgoing things like that. Uh, but I think we're always looking for probably like all of us on this. We're always looking for different ways, new initiatives, ways we can maybe make a, a bit more money to progress the club and develop the club. Um, We'd love to have a screen at the ground, something like that would be would be excellent. We've got to be mindful of all our developments in terms of what we do, um, because it is a government facility, but at the moment we're working alongside them to remove, um, make some sort of amendments to the fencing around our, our ground to make uh, increase the capacity and ensure that we can get more people through the gate. So we're looking at development, and we're such an early stage. I mean, we've literally just completed our first season, which wasn't the season now, so <laughs> yeah, next to people we're starting from, we're still at year zero, um, which, um, although we founded the club three years ago, so yeah, we've got um, a commercial team who I'm sure would always look at different opportunities and ways in which we can ensure that club is sustainable and it grows, so that's, yeah, I'm sure they'll be in touch with John. Sure. Gary, any anything you want to say, about to say? Yeah, come and see us, John. So uh, we've got a new, new ground on the uh, A20 there, um, and we've got uh, 400 metres of frontage on the A20, which apparently is a six business road into London, so uh, yeah, yeah I'm serious. Fantastic. I think, John, have you had a lot of, uh, have you had a lot of interest, John? Yeah, we've had a lot of success. I mean, you know, when I sort you know, when I sort of joined uh, my club group about six months ago, obviously we had a very different business plan, a very different focus. And obviously this focus, COVID is taking everyone by surprise and, you know, you've had to almost do a right turn. So um, that is the big discussion is obviously, look, you know, everyone's got different levels of, you know, sort of ability commercial wise. But, you know, as you guys uh, probably know, um, you know, you've got limited resources, but the commercial side is massive. So whatever you can add to that, um, it, 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 yeah, we've got a drive we've got a drive in cinema which is set up for now, so oh, they great. I'll bring up one of those. Yeah, it's like the old fashioned um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, big massive one, yeah, we're setting it all up all starting from the second uh, of July, so get on our website. So the cars can drive in and things like that, yeah. like American driving. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like yeah, yeah. Burgers, chips. Like Greece. Done a deal with my life. I think Greece made that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, what you got to convert? Conversal, the weather's good, but it's you know, because it was funny. We were going, like, we were going to, uh, we went down to Sutton and did a sort of erection or something, and then we got to Crawley. And, you know, my boss, that's there, my club group, he comes up with Devon, but he came up with a little conversal that I'm sure he got in his midlife crisis. We were going down the M23, and he started really tipping down, and he had his foot down. And I was just laughing as well. He had to pull off and he was absolutely drenched. But, you know, that's it just weather. So I think it's going to be fantastic next week. So hopefully we can have a wonderful July where, you know, we've got some nice weather and we can do lots of nice things. Well, it starts again. There's a lot of stuff on, on, on actually, you know, the sanitizer, you know, sort of the, the PPE equipment. I think I was, I was talking, I've got some meetings next week about some, you know, some recyclable um, PPE equipment, you know, the masks, the gowns, you know, all different stuff. So it's actually affordable PPE, you know, sanitizer that, that sprays and it lasts for a month, a uh, reasonable rate, you know, where you can get. It's great when you start letting fans back in. So there's lots of good ideas, um, lots of things coming to us all the time that we're dealing with. That we might be able to pass on to you guys. It's really my message, so it's, it's well worth a, a chat. Okay, that'll be plenty. Have you got anything, mate? Have you got any, uh, any thing you'd like to say? No, not really. I mean, you know, I, I, to be fair, I've seen quite a lot of the uh, marketing for my, my club group. And I get regular emails and seeing 
you know, the assistance they're offering. And fortunately, we, we've got a treasurer who is an accountant who specialises in the hospitality and leisure sector. So I, I hope we've tapped into everything you know, possible, any any grants, any bounce back loans. Obviously, he, he handled the fur of the players up till the end of April. Um, but absolutely, there'll, there'll be a lot of clubs that won't have access to somebody of, of, of his skill. And um, absolutely, you're right. You know, there's so many clubs that miss out on opportunities to claim for various things, get grants. And I, I know I think it's a great thing that you're doing. And I'm seeing your marketing, and I look at it, and I check it to make sure you know we've not missed anything. So yeah, I think there'll be loads of clubs that that can tap into. Okay, well, thanks very much, John. Thanks for your time. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to stay with us, or you've got to. Well, chat. Gary, can I just step in? We've got, we've got, um, I've got Jack Pierce on the line here. You might want to hear some. He's probably going to give more money and things to the clubs than what you are, John, with the FA. He's he's uh, he's Father Christmas. Are you there, Father Christmas? <laughs> I don't think I'll even call me Father Christmas. But good evening to you, Mick. Good evening. Good evening. And uh, obviously, I don't know. Hopefully, you know we got on the show tonight. But what? Look, listen. No, Shahid's on the show. Right. Okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Jack. <laughs> he's sorry. He's saying sorry. Can you hear him, Jack? No, he should never apologise. Did I hear John Salarco in the background? <laughs> Yes, he won't remember. He won't remember me from the eighties because um, uh, my one of my best friends in football was Alan Smith when um, he was at Crystal Palace, and we okay. took Andy Woodman on loan, and we sent him Simon Roger, and wow. uh, those were good days. That's when they used to train where two in a mission play now. Yes, it was a complete hole. <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh, they were the good old days. No, Alan, was, Alan, Alan signed me. Um, so I signed for Palace at 13. Alan, you know, I signed for Steve Coppels at Brentford at 16. And, and Alan was my youth team coach, obviously, in the South East County days as a 14, 15 year old. And he had me and yeah. obviously Gavin Southgate and some of the boys. Yeah, there. Andy Woodman, Steve you know, and all them. And I'll tell you what, how the game's changed. I asked him how he thinks Peter and his wife would have got on in the modern day that looked after the canteen room there. When you walked in, he had a bag on, all the racing papers all over the desk <laughs> and everything. <laughs> you wouldn't see that in a Premier League club today. That's a dead sir. He was a great lad, Peter. Anyway, I can't have you two having a personal chit-chat on our show tonight. Oh, what do you want to know? <laughs> Can you, I'll give you John's number. You can speak to him afterwards, Jack. Yeah, yeah, go on. What do you want? <laughs> listen, listen. Oh, look, we're talking about chairman, and we've heard some interesting stories because, uh, you know, chairmen don't really get, you know, an, enough uh, pats on the back, from my opinion. That's including you, Jack. I know you're not the chairman, Dan Bogner, now. But obviously, can I just ask one question? Mark White's asked me, I said, how many committees do you actually sit on? What my actual various jobs are. Yeah, go on. What, I'm, that... I'm vice chairman of the Football Association representing the national game. The FA has an independent chairman. It then has two vice chairmen, one for the professional game, which is Peter McCormack, for the prep, prep, and then you have one for the national game, which represents all football below EFL2, and that's me. I sit as vice chairman of the National League, I sit on the main board of the Football Foundation and I'm, uh, even though I don't take the title, um, I am Vice Chairman of Bognor Football Club, which I've celebrated my 50th year this year, and I am the team manager, which I've done on and off for 35 years, and uh, that's it really. So these are novices. novices. <laughs> Right. I've just celebrated my 71st oh. birthday. So that's where we are, love. Uh, right. OK, look, look, Jack, listen, we've all gone through this virus. It's hit all the clubs. I suspect you've been on plenty of committees sitting up there in your sort of hierarchy at the top of Wembley Stadium it, it, with your Bentley driving up there. Now, what, yeah, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what have you done for these clubs that are going to help them get back on their feet? What is the FA's initiatives or bad news, in fact, that they might want to hear now that maybe you already know? Is there any initiatives that the FA are going to help 
and whether there's any bad news well, they need. Uh, like, like a lot of things, uh, I'm also the chairman of the Alliance Committee, which looks after all non-league football from steps one to four, where I work on that with the other leagues, the four main leagues. Uh, the situation is very, it's like lots of things in life, all the good work you've done gets very little publicity. Uh, I'm going to say, for instance, the FA put £30 million a year into the Football Foundation. Now, that's a lot of money. Whichever way you want to dress it up, that is a lot of money. The Premier League put a little bit less in, about £26 million, and government put about, at the moment, about £18 million in. It's about £70 million a year the Football Foundation administers on behalf. And it does great work, but like everything, it's difficult um, uh, getting what you do out there all the time. Because um, there's, there's a lot of hungry mouths to feed. In the National League system alone, there's just under a thousand clubs. So it's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of mouths to feed. From the FA's point of view, I think it's been publicised that they've, you know, they're no different to any other body. They're another body that everyone hides behind. If you blame someone, say the FA, but there's never any name of who at the FA. It's just the FA. And that takes, there's a, the number of people that get away with things by blaming the FA is quite incredible. But like all the other jobs, they do great work, but it gets very little publicity. And that always saddens me. But at the moment, what they forget is the FA is a non for profit organisation. So every bit of pet money they get, they invest back in the game. But the way it works is the, the professional game bring most of the money into it because our biggest um, uh, revenue incomes are mainly from media and the England team and that, and that's mostly the professional game. So we have to, we have our central funding with all the people we employ and all the initiatives they do, and then what's left gets shared between the professional game and the um, uh, and the, the national game below. I was going to say amateur, but it's not now. It's the national game below the football league, and that is over the years been about the national game were receiving about 60 million just under which they reinvest back into the game at all levels through counties and through everything else they do hold up hold Obviously. up hold up hold up mate are you reading from a script there mate no no i'm just saying you sure you ain't got I'm some not script ready i'm just here you're talking <laughs> yeah. to me <laughs> listen <laughs> I can only give you the facts. Listen, you people don't like hearing the facts. I, I, well, I know that. It I, don't make good listening. <laughs> listen, listen, is there any bad news on the horizon? I keep hearing yeah, your yeah. Whiz- yeah, oh, well, let, say, Let's hear it. Let's hear it. What you've got to remember, we've lost the Euros. We've got no FA Cup. We've got no matches at Wembley. There's no concerts. We lost the whole concert season. Now, if you're a non for profit organisation, you don't have massive reserves. So we have took a, a tremendous hit, and that will mean that there will be less money to reinvest into the game. What, like the FA, and, like the FA Cup, Jack? Yeah, that will that will take that will be uh, you know what the exact figures are at the moment. We're not sure, but that will have to take a reduction, like lots Can of I things. Ask you know. Okay, hold on, sorry. hold on, Jack. Go on, Gary. Yeah, Jack, Gary, that's Gary, mate. Game funds. 
Once you get into the first rain proper going forward from there, that part of the fund comes from the professional games financial bit. So that's how it works in general. Now, it's a very complicated, what has to happen because of TV and everything else, the third round has to take place with the compacted calendar in the first week in January. Otherwise, it can't happen. So that's why the FA Cup has to play every fortnight, near enough, as you go through from August through. Now, obviously, the, the clubs normally start playing in August. If we can get it away in September, there's a good chance we could get most of the clubs in. Once we go past September, then there will be, uh, you know, casualties, I think is the word, best way to put it. But we're trying to reduce those casualties as much as we can. Because you might, we feel, and nothing, that, what I'm telling you now is only what's in debate. And the debate comes from the fact we all feel that from the National EFL 2 down, the National League down, it will be very difficult for clubs in sets 1 to 4, most probably most at 4, to play with 8 crowds. Most probably at 5 and 6 with 8 crowds. But because there's money in the FA Cup and there's prize money for both the winners and losers, you might be able to have one game in the month if it was behind closed doors with money. Now that's don't let anyone go run and think of, don't say Jack Pierce is going to play in the FA Cup. All I'm telling you is that there's lots of ideas in the melting pot at the moment because what we want to try and do is have as many clubs stay in playing football than anything else. We want to keep the financial stability of clubs as much as we can. And um, that's a massive job, and there's lots of people working. But, you know, government has got lots of other priorities, but we're working with them. The main thing we also think is that it, the various steps due to the ground grading, you've got capacities, and we all can tell you what the capacity of our stadium is. And we're working on something where potentially you might get 20% of your capacity allowed in, or up to 33% with the social distancing, and we might be able to get rid of that. Where the secondary spend with the social club comes in, even though pubs might be back, they don't suddenly get 100 or 200 people trying to get in there and out in 10 minutes. So that might have to be different. So there's lots of things we're looking at. What I can tell you is most of the people at the, uh, who are working from home, I've never been so busy on administration of football in my life, on phones and everything else, and yet there's no game taking place. It's quite incredible, really, because of all the different things that you have. And Shahida tell you, it's just non-stop meetings on Zoom and everything else, and it's, it's quite tiring, really. And, and then you don't get rid of your frustrations by having a game at the end of the week or during the week to actually enjoy. Are you, are, so, you, are you still getting your meals on wheels? That's what I want to know. Well, at my age. <laughs> are they still well, delivering yeah. it to you, Jack? Hey? Are they still delivering it to you okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're all okay. Listen, yeah, we're fine. listen, sorry, yeah, right. Fine. I want to put out, we've got four chairmen here that want to maybe ask a question. Sorry, Gary. Would you, you know, let's get our chairman to ask him something. Does anybody want to ask Jack a question while we've got him on the phone? Yeah, yeah. I've got a lot of time, Russell. I've got him. Sorry, Gary. Russell, go on. Uh,
that it might then be finished on a points per game. So although this season, at our level, they said null and void, next season they said it could be points per game. So I don't know why, Jack, what's your thinking on that? Why would points per game be better next season but not this season? Or why is there no sort of consistent approach? Well, a difficult question to answer. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, so I understand the question. And I can't run away from the fact I was at the forefront of bringing the leagues together at step one to four. Uh, the rationale is that you've got a situation. There is there's nothing in FA rules where you can get you can decide to get a league on points per game. That does not exist. To do that, you need to get a resolution to change your league rules and FA rules during the season. Now, where we have the beauty, the Premier League, which is the very top league, they're playing the season out, and you can't argue with that, and so is the Championship. Uh, But when you talk about Leagues 2 and 3 of the EFL and the National League, it's one league controlling those bodies, so you can go to the clubs and ask the clubs for their opinion. What I find is that I've seen lots of letters come in on this subject, that you can tell roughly where someone is depending on what letter they write. And uh, so that I'll be very interested what the reaction will be to points per game if we bring it in before anybody knows where they might be in the league. <laughs> that is going to be a very interesting stat. Because I think there's a lot of people that are like mid-table where they don't know where they're going. They don't bother. So they'll go with it. If you're up the top, and you think you're going to get in the playoffs or win it, you know where your vote is. And if you think you're going to get relegated with 10 games to go, you also know you're going to vote against it. So it, it is an interesting one. But the difference between the National League system is once you get to step three to seven, you have a situation where there's more than one lead for that level. So therefore, you'd have to get everybody to agree because you can't promote, you've got 15 leagues at step five going into four leagues at step four. You can't have 10 wanting to do null and void and five wanting to do points per game or the other way round. You, so you've got to get a consensus. And the other thing that not many speak about is that if you cease as a club at any time during the season, either whatever it is, you run out of money, players don't want to play, you leave a league, at steps three to seven, your seat, your results shall be non and void. That's in the rules. And that doesn't matter what effect you have on promotional relegation. So even if there's four games to play for a season, you as a club packed up, it's in the rules that your your it's normally teams that are struggling down the bottom because it normally is money, not always. Your whole season's results are null and void. Irrespective, that means the team that's top of the league is suddenly second. Now, that is the way it's done. Now, so it has got a lot in it, null and void. And all I know is, talking where I am, and I understand points per game, and if that's what the majority of people want to do, there is nothing wrong with it. But the beauty of the game to me has all been how unexpected it can be, you know, and it is not a mathematical calculation football. The number of games that I thought when I turned up we should win this and I went home losing, and on the opposite, I thought I'd do well to get out of here today with a bit of uh, not losing and we win. That's the beauty of the game. You never know what's going to be there. So here you can work out on a mathematical equation what's going to happen with 10 games to go. I'll be honest with you, I'm not in favour of that. But if that's what the majority want to do, that's fine. Thank, but thank, I do feel for Tram Mir and, and where they are. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, go, sorry, carry on. Russell, was it? Or Gary? Yeah, Gary. Well, um, yeah, Gary from Craig Wanderers, obviously you gave us a good hiding this year, 7-2, so huh. it was a good hiding. Um, yeah, Gary, I'm going to ask you a question. In 2002, in the Kent League, we was, we, there was one, two games to go and Famisham um, went out of business, we beat them 6 nil or 8 nil or whatever, so everyone was beating 10 nil and all that. And uh, we, were, we was 
due to play. I'm so we were just expecting all the results to be uh, another point, but like, perhaps the front results. And all of a sudden, two games to go, the committee voted his points per game, and then they start messed up, messed up because both their games we ended up with in the league. And now this this year, same again, is um, we're second in the league, but the committee. It's only six people, like you say. If I was in the league committee and I was in the relegation, I would have done it. You know, be hypocritical to say, say else. But my biggest problem is, is why didn't all the teams of step six, uh, three to seven, have a vote like like there? All the other leagues, all the teams, and not not the committees deciding. I think it's step three. I think the Northern League they vote point for the game, and someone else is on the third vote point for the game because of that committee. Woods obviously in their teams as if uh, you know you can take money to put the points of the game. So if, I wouldn't have had a problem if initially in the league everyone voted and they voted another point, I wouldn't have had a problem with that. But it's only the five or six people on the committee who's obviously teams. You know, right. Okay, guys, I think you got your point. Come on in, Jack. What's the answer, mate? Well the season is that you have your you, at every year's AGM you put people in charge to make decisions on your behalf and you have to get a consensus i'm going to say that in the national league system there's over 60 divisions nearly 72 divisions there's 1700 clubs and there's something like 22 leagues something like that 21 leagues it's very difficult to get a consensus that you know one league will want it one way one league will want it the other way and all i'm saying is it's there's no there is, it was nobody's fault, the pandemic. It's very difficult to be logical about something when you've got nothing to go on in the past and there's no decision that pleases everybody. So all you can do, we were being told at the Alliance that the leagues wanted an early decision because of where they wanted. They wanted an early decision. It's been challenged by say Shields, and there's a hundred and whatever it is, 20, uh, loads of 23 page report from the most eminent lawyers in the country that say that, you know, they got the greatest sympathy for clubs in that situation, but the way it was dealt with was perfectly legal, above board, and dealt with in the proper manner. Right. Now, I do understand there will be people that aren't happy but I can assure you it went through the process that was the same thing. And all we're going to try and do this year as an FA is make sure that, because when you kick off any season, you should know what the rules are you're going to be playing by. And that will be put to clubs whether they want to be able to decide on points per game. But if you do, when do you do it? That's your problem you've got. Jack, because do you think it's right after 50% of the games played or not? Jack, that, th th this is a whole show. We could do a whole show on just that topic. And, and, and this yeah. is going to be debated and debated and debated and debated. But yeah. listen, yeah. Jack, I really appreciate one last word before we start wrapping up the show. If you could give any bit of advice to these four chairmen that are sitting here, what will you give them before we wrap the show up? In respect of what... Um, uh, Being a chairman, mate. Being a chairman, you know. Levels of the game. Go on. Give them, give them some of your wildly advice. Come on. Wildly advice? Well, I, I think today really summed up the game for me to a certain degree. Football de defies all business logic at times. And I admire people that do take on the job of chairman of football clubs. Because we have 18 clubs today... We've been chairing today the playoffs for the National League, North and South. And when you think the cost that's going to cost to the clubs to take part in maybe three games, two games at the most games, and out of the six in each league, there's only going to be one winner. In an half an expensive lottery ticket, and their, their fans should be absolutely... Um, uh, Desire for the fans, they say, yeah, we'll be there behind you, but it will be the chairman putting the bill. And some of those bills will be far higher than uh, when you do the testing, getting your ground up together. And I admire them for, you know, challenging it. And anybody that runs a football club, it is a thankless task. 
you know, but we do it. We all have a go at it. It's great fun when you're winning. But, you know, it, you, you, there's lonely times when you're getting beat. And um, all I do, I, I can't give any advice to you, except I think most of us are crackers. That's, uh, that's where I am with it. But I admire the way we do. Football's a great sport for people to overcome adversity and keep going at things and try to get there better they can. And um, uh, that's all you can do. Right. Uh, you can only be a... F- and, and the other thing is, you can't own a football club. I don't care what anybody says, you're a custodian. And the best thing you can do is leave it in a better state than you found it. And if we did that, we'd all do a great deal for the game. Right. Jack Pearce, you're a top man, mate. And I, I, I thank you very much. I can see that they've taken your wild advice. And I can see Shahid... He's sweat, was sweating. He's probably glad he didn't make the playoffs this season, along with Patrick in the, the two. So they're probably happy bunnies with what you've just said anyway at the minute. They look relieved chairman in my eyes. But, Jack, really appreciate the fact you've come on. Like you always do to help the non-league people. Thank you very much, mate, and we will have you on the show soon. Look after yourself, everybody. And nice speaking to you again, John. All the best. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. information that Jack gave everybody. I think that's a good ending to the show. Just like to say thank you very much for all coming on. I really do appreciate it. Well, not me. We both really appreciate your time. I th- me personally, I learned a lot from you guys. You know, it's interesting to speak to you, get different thoughts about your, your the team that you're running and everything and the life that you lead it with, within a non-league football club. So I'm really grateful and thankful for coming on our show. And you, John, thanks to you as well coming on. And uh, I hope your new venture goes really well. Can I, can I, can I add to that? Sorry, I'll just butt in before you want to say, sorry about that, Patrick. John, with John, we, what we will do, John, we will put all your information out when we start tweeting out on our social networks from tomorrow or even tonight, mate. So the word will be spread for John Solarco, my club group. It will be out there, John. We really appreciate you sitting around. I know you're jumping at the bit to go and see what the Tottenham Man United score might be at the minute, but I appreciate you stuck with us, along with Shahid, along with Patrick, along with Gary, and along with our friend Russell out there in Jersey Bulls. Gary, would you like to sort of, any anything you want to say quickly from any one of you? Guys, you're all, um, I'd just say you're all welcome to, we'd be delighted to have any, all of you come to Jersey at some point. Um, welcome, we'd love to see you. Uh, just drop us a line if you want to come over Welcome. Wow, wow. Well, that's what good contacts mean. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Networking. What John said, networking. Yeah. Thanks, guys. You know, it's lovely to meet all you guys. Looking forward to meeting you, and hopefully we can we can do something together. But you're all football people. I, I totally admire what you guys do running football clubs, and, and good luck with that. And uh, well done. And it's, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And I'm going to go and um, <laughs> grab a beer, a well earned beer, and, and watch the second half. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. What, 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 Patrick, 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 would you like to say a few words before you go? Uh, just, you know, uh, nice to hear other, other people. Um, Shahid, in particular, is obviously been in the chair of a really hot seat, you know, being a football league club. I can't imagine what it must be like being a, a chairman at that level. Uh, I, I know, you know, he, he step two, the expectations are significant. And, you know, for your other guys, Jersey Bulls sympathise with you boys. You, you definitely should have been promoted. Crazy all sounds like it's going to be really exciting for the future. But I think we've all got to just look forward to that next season. I think we've got to cut our coats according to our cloth. Uh, I, I agree with Jack. We are custodians. Do I use the word caretaker? I think that's what a chairman is, really. And let's try and leave our clubs in a better place than we found them. Thank you, Patrick. We'll, we'll move on to Gary. Would you like to say... A couple of words yeah. before you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of feeling very, very positive at the moment. I'm thinking, you know, with all what's happened, is everyone's mindset has become local. You know, everyone's sort of everyone's mindset is local, local community. Where before, well, before it all happened, transport and everything was so easy. You know, you just you wouldn't even think about going away for the weekend in England. So much you just go, oh, just well, let's let's have a party. I have a party. You know, I party in Portugal, so you can meet people in Portugal. It's like going to like, London, or you want to go to like, Bromley, Bromley, 
70 minutes of central London by drawing one day probably when you get trained to central London. So, but now with this, everyone's local and obviously the capacities, I think the capacities are going to be cut, which it does seem like it is. I think, I think the level we're at, I think it's going to be very, very positive, very community orientated. Crowds are going to go up. There's going to be a lot more higher standard of higher standard of football because there's a lot of going to be so many elite players coming into non league. Uh, let's just talk to our manager, like, you know, we've signed our players all up. Last season, we've got a superb team on, but I'm saying it's got to be a little bit careful. I'll have to, I love you, I love you, you love the club, we, we really think a lot about Cray Wanderers and we, good luck to Russell and Joe down there, we really hope you do well this coming season whenever we resume. We'll have the last note with Mr Shahid Azim, come on Shahid, have you enjoyed tonight's show and any words of wisdom before we shut the show down? Uh, look, um, for me, um, I think actually having Jack on there was absolutely vital, look. I work with Jack, I, I sit on the board with him on the National League, I, I chair the commercial committee, and here's a guy, uh, and I, I really want to sort of thank Jack, I mean, he is a passionate guy who sits actually, one minute he's flying in, sitting next to the guys uh, you know, Southgate to a, a European match, and then flying back next day to running the Bogdan Regis clearing the changing room, so he is what, what football club's all about, is what football's about, I mean, as you just said, he's a real lot Years. Now, the biggest challenge we had, and I sat, and then I, I sat on the National League board, and, and, and the challenges of uh, um, playoffs and, and, and you know points per game. You know, there was seasons after me. I'm literally zoomed out on all of these teams, and and there's no right or wrong. It's, it's something that happened, you know, and that it was out of our control, uh, out of anybody's control really. And I think the situation is we just got to make the best of it. I hope we all come out as better, better people. I think we come back as a, a better society, and I think uh, you know, as football club and any sport, I think will play a major, major part in, in galvanising communities and to get people back to mind. I think you know, well, football club, no matter what level you are, whether you're in the Premier League or whether you are, you know, playing something part football, it means something to everybody. Sure. Well, thanks very much. I know we've really run over now, and uh, thanks very much for staying with us and really having uh, appreciated you coming on our show and uh, really have enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've had your chance to put yourself across, and uh, I hope you have enjoyed being with us. And uh, we'll hopefully, you never know, we'll catch up halfway through the season, whenever that is, and see how all your how both all your teams are progressing. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you to all the viewers and listeners. This is the Non-League Banter Show. Over and out. Good night.